Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Elena Amit, and welcome to our first Life After Lockdown event. A new vaccine or treatment, now what? So as people are coming through, through the door to our, our first of our series in Life After Lockdown, I just want to welcome you and talk about what, our, what the series will be about. This series aims to visualise what life after lockdown will look like. Today, we're specifically exploring the current scientific landscape in COVID-19 vaccines and treatment, and we'll touch on what needs to be done to ensure we are better prepared for the future. As I said, my name is Elena Amat. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Science. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I would also like to pay respect to elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Now we have a panel on screen, as you can see, um, and I will uh, introduce them. Uh, we, have, uh, we have Professor Michael Wallach from the School of Life Sciences at UTS. We have uh, Lisa Sedger, who's also from the School of Life Sciences at UTS and Professor Phil Hansborough, who is the Chair of Inflammation at the School of Life Sciences and Centenary Institute. Um, so a, a very um, distinguished panel today to talk about our, um, our, our very interesting topic. So what do we have is a series of questions and we also wish to encourage people to use uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So if we have any technical problems, just please um, bear with us. But if you have any questions, send them along through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll have some time at the end to put them up to our panel. And we also have some questions that will come in uh, uh, through the event. So let's just kick off if, uh, if we're ready to go. Our first panelist is Lisa Sedger. Um, and I've got a few questions to start for Lisa. Each person is going to be speaking roughly around 10 minutes, just so we have enough time for some good Q&A. Okay, Lisa, first question. Let's start by familiarising ourselves with the virus. What is COVID-19? Oh, thanks, Alana. Uh, well, the first thing to probably define is what a virus is compared to what the disease is. So COVID is actually the disease, stands for Coronavirus Infectious Disease, first in a, described in 2019. Whereas the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus is the actual microorganism. So a virus is essentially just a piece of genetic material, a bit like our chromosomes wrapped in a protein shell. And some viruses have a fatty or lipid layer, an envelope layer outside of that again. The coronavirus is the microorganism and COVID is the disease, which is the respiratory tract infection that ultimately ends up for some people in a very severe pneumonia. Thank you for that introduction. So let's think about, we, we've heard of viruses for the past, you know, many, many, many years, but also in past decades as well. But let's think about this virus and how is it different from SARS or MERS? Ones that well, we've, we've known on, of the, in the recent future, the recent past, sorry. Well, SARS and MERS, again, they actually stand for the, the disease really. SARS is severe acute respiratory syndrome and MERS is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and they're all caused by coronaviruses. Uh, in this case, as with SARS and MERS, we think the virus originated from bats. Bats have lots of coronaviruses, um, and they don't seem to affect bats very much, but bats, when they're infected, will drop the virus in their, in their droppings. They will then be exposed to animals, and once the virus can infect certain animal hosts, then the that animal becomes what we call an intermediate host. So somewhere along the line, another animal has become in contact with a human and the human has been infected. We don't think it's from eating meat. That's an important um, clarification. It's more close contact with an animal that's infected and potentially infectious at the time that we come, humans come in contact with it. So where do these viruses arrive from? The SARS epidemic from 2000, 2003, uh, we think the virus was a, well, we know the virus was a bat virus and we think the intermediate animal host was probably a ferret, uh, not a ferret, a, a civet. The big question about this virus is we don't yet really know what the intermediate host is. 
some really nice virology works been done by the Chinese group and just published recently in the journal Science. They've taken the virus from patients, from, from COVID patients in China and infected uh, in a high level containment laboratory, a number of different animals. This included ferrets um, and also cats and dogs and pigs and chickens and ducks to try and see which animals the virus can replicate in. And we know the virus can replicate in cats, uh, less so in dogs, but interestingly, not in chickens, pigs, ducks. So the possibility is that an intermediate animal, possibly a cat or a cat-like animal, um, is an intermediate host. And somewhere along the line, humans have come into close contact with an infected intermediate host, and then the virus has spread into humans. And the reason it's a big deal for humans is this virus has never been in the human population before. So we see it as a brand new virus. Our immune system has never seen it. We have no prior immunity to the virus. That's what makes it a new virus. That's what makes it spread so quickly in our populations. Thanks. Did you want to comment on any of the speculation out there about the source of the virus? Oh, look, there's a few things going around in the media. Um, I know Donald Trump's been tweeting that it's come out of a high, uh, high level um, containment laboratory in China, but all the sequence data on the actual genome of the virus would indicate quite clearly that it is a bat virus in origin. Um, what the intermediate host is, is still unclear. Uh, I mentioned the publication that shows some animals that we know can uh, be infected by the virus, but in the case of this particular epidemic, it is not yet being um, defined with any degree of clarity what the intermediate animal host was. Um, but I think the evidence is quite strong and all the scientists worldwide that are sharing the sequence of the genome of the viruses from patients, everybody's saying it does not look like a deliberate recombination event in a lab, but rather from, from bats and an intermediate host. Thank you. Why, why does it need an intermediate? Well, the bat virus has evolved inside bats um, and replicates in bats. So it's suited to infecting bats. It's not suited to replicating in humans. So it's needed something in between that where the virus can evolve and change a little bit um, and then become more infectious to humans. So one of the reasons we get these emerging brand new diseases in human populations is that mankind is, in, is you know, in, in entering into more and more uh, wilderness areas and exposing ourselves more and more to wild animals in wilderness areas. Um, and so that's where a lot of these uh, emerging viruses come from. We know, for example, Ebola, uh, Marburg fever, usually it's bats and then infected monkeys and then hunters coming in contact with um, dead or infected uh, monkeys. So we need that intermediate host for the bat virus to then gain, um, I guess, a replication advantage to be able to replicate and infect a human. Thank you. Um, can we talk a little bit about your um, current contributions to COVID-19 treatments and research? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, look, I'm a, I'm a virologist and an immunologist and I've worked for a long time on virus host interactions. We kind of study how the virus um, evades the host immune system and then learn from that what, what we can about different ways to potentially manipulate the host immune system for, for example, treatments for inflammatory diseases. So one of the focuses we've got at the moment that's particularly relevant to this virus is we've been looking at also how to develop new antiviral um, agents. Um, everyone knows an antibiotic works against a bacteria but a bacteria has a really unique structure, quite different from a mammalian cell. Viruses have to get inside a mammalian cell to replicate. So finding a drug target is, is a little bit harder. We're trying, to, we're trying to look at different ways that we can combine two or more drugs uh, and how we might be able to better target just the virus infected cell with the antiviral drug so that it's not also affecting all the neighboring uninfected cells. So that's a little bit about the sort of work that, that we're doing. We're, we're very much basic science, proof of principle type experiments, but that's the strategy. And when we find avenues that, that might work, then we look to try and commercialize them. Thanks. And last question for you, Lisa. Putting your, th uh, looking in the crystal ball, um, in six, 12, 18 months time, what do you think? How will this virus evolve and are we stuck with it? Oh, 
I need a crystal ball, Helena. No, no. <laughs> I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that. Uh, what's going to happen is we'll develop some antivirals. There's lots of clinical trials at the moment on um, a whole bunch of drugs. Rem remdesivir looks particularly um, interesting at the moment and, and might be useful. Once we have an antiviral drug, we have a way to control it in the population. Once we have a vaccine, we have a way to control it in a population. Until then, it's hard to predict how it's going to spread. And that's why the social distancing is our best mechanism of preventing spread. As we do more basic science on the virus and understand what other animals it can uh, infect and exist in, if we understand where the animal reservoirs are from the virus, then we'll have a better idea to be able to predict whether it's still going to be around for a long time or whether like um, SARS, it just emerges, we manage to control it and then we don't really see it again. So yeah, need a crystal ball. We need more information. This is a new virus, so we're still learning about it. Fantastic, thank you so much, Lucy. We might come back to you with some of the questions that are coming through um, in the panel. Good segue into uh, a good introduction of vaccines and a good segue into our next speaker. Thank you, Lisa. I'll just um, now ask some questions of Michael Wallach. Um, Michael, there's been a lot of talk about finding a vaccine um, and, uh, and one of the panel members, uh, sorry, one of the uh, audience members, Jenny C, has asked a question um, contacted ahead of time. Are we more likely to develop a cure, uh, that is a treatment, or a vaccine a preventative for COVID-19? Is there a preference? Michael, unmute yourself. Got it. Thank yeah. you. For, thank you for the introduction. Um, so um, both uh, avenues are being explored very uh, diligently by many groups around the world. Uh, both aspects and both sides of this equation are very uh, challenging. There's no question. So the crystal ball question is, is accurate. Um, I know groups in various countries doing a lot of drug screening and uh, this virus seems to be extremely uh, difficult to find a drug that's really effective against it. And we've had trouble developing uh, drugs uh, against viruses for many years as we know. Um, on the same, uh, same problem we have is with vaccines. Uh, the approaches that have been used against SARS and MERS to develop vaccines have often uh, not led to success. And in fact, uh, the 2003 outbreak of SARS led to a lot of vaccine research and no real effective vaccine had been uh, uh, created. We move, of course, many years forward. We have tools available to us today that we didn't have then, but even so, um, it looks very much like the development of a vaccine is, is very, very challenging. And I think we just have to accept the fact that for the time being, we can't sit around waiting for them. We have to assume it's gonna take a, a, a long period of time. Some say 18 months. In the normal frame of science um, discovery, that new vaccines and drugs often take five, 10 years, if not longer. Everything's being done that's possible, and I'm involved in my own research to shorten that time frame, and then um, to tr try to bring it to a length of time that's much shorter than that. I would um, therefore recommend that we think about, if we're talking about how do we get out of lockdown, that we probably won't have in place within the next few months, certainly, something that's going to be very effective. Uh, and um, we have to accept that fact. With that said, uh, work I'm doing and others uh, is looking very encouraging, and it could be that we'll do better than, than that. Um, and certainly testing is a very key part. So if I had my crystal ball on the vaccine side, I would say um, of a really true type of flu vaccine or measles vaccine that is effective, or is partially effective at least, uh, it's gonna take a while probably at least a year, if not more, just testing and going through phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials, getting FDA approval, um, getting manufacturing going, and everything that goes with it, that's gonna take a while. Thanks, Michael. And in terms of, I mean, we hear a lot in the media about vaccines. So who do you think is winning the race for a vaccine, you know, albeit, albeit with the issues that you've just raised? Um, 
Well, the, you know, there are groups that early on announced that they have vaccines uh, in the UK, in the US, in Israel, and other countries. Uh, UQ have announced also. Um, I, I do believe there's potentially useful vaccine approaches that are being developed. It's hard to tell at this point who's ahead in the race. We, we, we can't tell until the vaccine is actually put into a patient. We see the immune response and we see the effectiveness of that immune response. So I would say right now, it's impossible to know who's ahead. What I would hope to see is that the FDA as they're doing, open the um, pipeline for us to try as many vaccines as possible in the clinical setting in a very, of course, controlled and safe manner. And then we'll know better, in fact, who's ahead in this race. Thank you. So uh, in, in some of the media, I've heard you say um, that the, the virus has controlled us and now we have to control it. Yeah. What does controlling it look like? Can you comment on where you think lockdown measures in the next six months uh, will look like? What are the easings of these restrictions in an ideal world? Are we thinking max vaccinations, more or less social distancing, herd immunity, all the stuff we hear about now. What do you think are the strategies in which we can control it? So as you've seen in the world, there are countries that took the strategy, like uh, Taiwan, uh, even New Zealand, to, to lock down very early in the piece, whereas Sweden was at the uh, other extreme of not locking down at all, or, or very m minimally. Um, and we've seen the effects of that, whereas in Taiwan, you've had a relatively almost you know, 10 to 20 deaths I don't know the latest figure, and in Sweden now you're over 2,500 deaths in a population half the size of Taiwan. So those two strategies have shown very different results. I think Australia has taken a, a good uh, strategy so far, but of course the level of herd immunity in Australia will be very low. Mm -hmm. So the only way to get out of lockdown is in a gradual way with the um, people who you uh, have gone through infections, who are presumed to be, for the large part, um, immune against reinfection. People who show antibody titer, once we can get an antibody test online, can probably start going out and maintain social distancing, while uh, others have to be more careful. Certainly vulnerable populations that have other complicating health issues have to be very careful going out. We cannot become complacent to think that because we got through the first wave, there aren't mm -hmm. going to be more. There is assumptions that we all agree upon that there will be additional waves and perhaps even worse than the present one that we went through. So in order to avoid that, society has to be now educated and preparations have to be made, uh, put in place to test very rapidly. The apps that identify uh, focal points of infection need to be used and they're being taken up. I think uh, Australia is a good example of a country that can uh, really, um, gain control of the virus. It won't be perfect. Um, I'll talk in a minute about my work that adds to that control. Mm -hmm. uh, and not sit around waiting and hoping a vaccine will come or the virus will suddenly disappear and everything will go back to normal. We will not have that occur. But if we work together in an altruistic and a much more harmonious fashion than we ever have done in the past, I think we can gain control of the virus. Thank you, Michael. Um, can you just comment a little bit more about reinfection and the, and the risk of reinfection and the data on yeah. reinfection at this stage? The data I've seen on reinfection, and uh, Phil and Lisa can add here if they wish to, have been mainly that probably I would assume over 90% of cases that go through a clear infection are rendered immune. It's, it's the people who have very mild or asymptomatic uh, infections that probably aren't developing solid immunity. The hope is that even in those cases, if they get reinfected, they'll remain as a mild infection because mild infections, even if you have more than one, are sustainable in the population, help to build herd immunity and prevent what we really need to prevent is severe uh, disease and mortality. Uh, Elena, Great. can Thank I add to that just quickly? Yeah, sure. Um, we're not really sure that people are reinfected um, there's evidence that people finish um, being infected. They don't have symptoms anymore. 
Uh, they test negative, they go home from hospital, and then there's reports that they still test positive later. But it's now emerging that maybe that later testing positive is that they have damaged cells that still harbour remnants of the virus that can be picked up in the tests. So perhaps it's not really a re-emergence. That's one possibility. The other possibility is the virus is, has been controlled to lower levels below which the test can pick up. And so the patient goes home, but they actually still do have a little bit of the virus. They finish treatment, therefore the virus takes over again. So we don't really think it's reinfection at this stage. Either of those other two scenarios are a better explanation. And when scientists have experimentally infected monkeys with the virus, um, I'm pretty sure I've read somewhere that the monkeys have proven immune to a re-challenge, a reinfection. So there's really good evidence that we do develop an immunity, an immune response, rather than be susceptible to reinfection. Yeah, I agree with Thank that. you. Thanks, yep. Lisa. Thanks for that. Um, Michael, would you like to tell us, uh, before we move to Phil, would you like to tell us about your research and, and how you're tackling COVID-19? Yeah, so um, based on previous research I had done on pandemic flu, I actually um, published in 2011 a paper that showed that uh, antibodies isolated from egg yolks of chickens immunized with the um, seasonal and pandemic flu viruses protect very effectively against um, infection by both H5N1, which uh, caused the famous bird flu, and that was threatening at the time, as well as seasonal flu viruses like H1N1. And in those trials, in fact, using just an na intranasal application of antibody from egg yolk called IGY, we got 100% protection based on mortality. That is, all the mice that are infected with a lethal dose of virus all died with the control antibody and all survived with the um, immune antibody. Uh, fast forward to COVID. What we see as a possible um, practical way of uh, acting to reduce transmission and spread of the virus is in humans doing the same thing and coding our uh, nasal and oral passage with the antibody, the IGY which would bind to immobilize, sequester, and aggregate the virus and prevent it from getting further down into the respiratory tract. And in that way, it acts as a barrier against infection. And in a sense, I look at it as an enhanced PPE or an enhanced mask. In that case, the expected result, and we're putting the, and working very hard to implement that as soon as possible, would be an infection that would largely be mild, would greatly reduce mortality and morbidity, and flatten the curve. In that way, it enables the population to gain herd immunity without seeing the devastating effects of the disease. Thank you so much. Best of luck with all of that. Um, questions for Phil Hansborough now. So Phil, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, can. Can you be, could, could you please talk about some of the recent trials you've been working on and um, around treatments and what contribution do you think these will make in the fight against COVID-19? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Elena. Uh, and thanks, Lisa and Michael. So they've quite nicely, they've very nicely introduced the fact that the ways that we can um, uh, reduce the impacts of this virus is through antivirals or vaccines. And another way that we can do it is through treatments. And so to do that, we need to understand what is driving the disease um, so that we can target some of those pathogenic features so that we know that most people get mild respiratory disease and somewhere between 2 and 10% progress to pneumonia and, and severe disease. And of these, about uh, people going to ECU, uh, to ICU uh, with about 50% mortality. So it's th those people that we're really trying to uh, we should really try to be treated um, is those who progress to this, these more severe diseases. And these severe diseases are driven by virally induced hyperinflammation. And that involves uh, inflammatory cells and a lot of inflammatory factors that uh, are called cytokines that drive this hyperinflammation and damage our, our own tissue while it's trying to get rid of the virus. And so, What's currently happening is we're trying to elucidate what are the components of that hyperinflammation so that we can try and dampen them down uh, with potential treatments 
so that we don't die from this acute respiratory distress. And so at the, up to now, so last time I counted, was about, uh, yesterday, there's 470 clinical trials going on around the world um, for, for lots of different things, but including many of these uh, components of this inflammatory response. So one of the advantages that we have uh, that's joint between UTS and Centenary is that we have a high level containment lab at Centenary uh, that enables us to do uh, infections of primary human respiratory cells, which we can get just from brushing the airways, or um, in vivo in mouse studies. And so in order to infect a mouse, we need a special mouse that has it, the human receptor put into that mouse so that the, uh, the virus can bind to it uh, in, in animals and cause the disease. And so we can use these platforms to quickly determine whether treatments might be effective against um, this COVID-19. And we can also do comparisons between them and see if there's actually any, any damaging effects of any of these treatments as well. So some of the things that we're trying is um, uh, inhibitors of upstream um, factors that drive a lot of these inflammatory responses in the first place. And one of these things is called an inflammasome. And that is a, a really upstream uh, factor that gets activated um, by infections that causes these downstream uh, cytokine storms and hyperinflammation. Now, an in, a really interesting thing about these inflammasomes is that they're at a really low level in bats. So Lisa was talking about bats and they, these harbor these viruses and don't suffer from them. And one of the reasons is because they have these really low inflammasome responses. So one of the things we're working on is an inhibitor of these inflammasomes as a potential treatment. So another thing uh, that we're working on is a complement. And so a complement involves a whole cascade of uh, proteins that once again are induced in an inflammatory response. Uh, and, and in particular in acute respiratory distress and complement also activates inflammasomes as well. And so we have inhibitors of complement as well that we're also trying. Um, we've also got antibodies against a lot of these individual inflammatory factors that we're trying alone or in combination. And then a really logical um, set of treatments that we're trying also is um, can we block the actual receptor that the virus binds to? So um, the virus binds to this ACE2 receptor. So can we use blockers and inhibitors of that receptor so that the virus can't bind to it anyway? Um, so that's another thing. Another thing that we're doing is that there's certain populations of people that are more susceptible to these viruses. So people with um, uh, emphysema, um, COPD, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and so um, as, as a collective, people have been finding um, treatments that are, are effective in these people. And so can they be used also to combat these, um, this COVID-19? So things like uh, metabolic modulators, antioxidants, hypoxia inhibitors as well, uh, as well as the standard treatments like azithromycin, which is an antibiotic that also has anti-inflammatory properties and steroids. Um, so an interesting thing about steroids is that this is um, commonly used to treat asthmatics. And it's quite surprising that asthmatics are not, don't seem to be susceptible uh, as much as you might think to the virus that causes COVID-19. So is that because they're taking steroids quite regularly to maintain their asthma? And is that suppressing the inflammatory response? So that's, a, that's an interesting uh, avenue as well. So there's lots of different possibilities there. Uh, there's lots of other ones as well. Uh, but we have these systems now in place to uh, try and test their efficacy, both in human cells and in, and in, in, in live animals, to, um, to, see, um, whether, to see what are effective, uh, what do not cause uh, side effects, and which are the most effective that we might then take into clinical trials.
Thank you very much. So how do you think, do you think it'll have to be combination therapies or it's very hard to tell you have to do the experiments? I think we do need to do the experiments. Um, but um, I think combination therapies could well be um, attractive. Now, that might be combination therapies to most effectively suppress the inflammation or what might be even better would be we need to stop the viral infection or control that as well as control the response to it. So we might do, uh, we might be best off once we've got effective antivirals using an antiviral to stop the infection as well as an anti-inflammatory to stop the downstream effects of, um, uh, of the infection. And they might be different timing as well. So you might want to start off um, antivirals as soon as you get symptoms and keep that going all the way through and only take the anti-inflammatories once you start to get more severe symptoms. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about antivirals. Maybe Phil or Lisa wants to talk about antivirals. There's some really interesting research coming out already. Yeah, if I can add one note on that, if you go to the um, US website on all the clinical trials listed and just write in the word remdesivir, you'll see all the trials that involve remdesivir are combinations, many of them with anti-inflammatories. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion in the scientific um, community about how you would use an anti-inflammatory. It's thought that you'd need to have a carefully dosed amount of the anti-inflammatory. You'd need it with an antiviral drug and the timing will be really critical. And it's usually the clinicians are suggesting to use them at the time that you get the, the severe respiratory symptoms to try and prevent that inflammatory pneumonia. So I think combination therapy will be the way to go. And that's what most of the clinical trials are testing. Can we talk about anti, uh, can we talk about viral load at this stage? Um, Lisa, did you want to speak about that? And then Phil, how do you, you obviously can model that. That might be something you might be looking well, at as well. Sure, just to define what a viral load is, it's, it's basically a molecular laboratory assay that, that estimates um, how much virus is actually present. So we would talk about a viral load as being high or low. It's a way of getting a sense of how much virus is in a person in, in that sample that's been taken. So if an antiviral drug is working, then the viral load will be low. The amount of virus will be low. So it's a way of monitoring how much virus. That's what a viral load is. So, and yes, Elena, uh, we can absolutely model that in, um, in these systems. Um, and so, uh, over time, what, we'll, what the research will investigate is are different treatments better at different stages of the disease as well? So we can, we can investigate all of that. Um, one thing I'll just add uh, with regards to ICUs is, in fact, there the variable load and exposure must be very high. And that's one of the reasons we see even relatively young people succumbing to the disease. Um, thank you. Uh, so... We might have time for Phil just to speak a little bit about um, uh, research and development in Australia. So, you know, some of the things that we've been hearing around the misinformation makes me really feel like, please, uh, let's just listen to scientists a little bit more. Um, but often we might need to make sure that they're funded as well as we possibly could be. Phil, would you like to talk a little bit about um, investment into R&D? And do you think COVID is a wake up call for greater investments? Yeah, thanks, Elena. And absolutely, I think so. So, so we're talking now about um, how long is it going to be till we t till we um, till we can produce a vaccine or a new treatment? We could have been so far ahead of the game um, if there was more um, funding put into research in the first place. Um, all 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 medical researchers around the country, they're um, half of their job is about trying to get fun, trying to find funding for their research. Um, at this point, the more money we put into this, um, then the quicker um, we will develop vaccines and our treatments. Um, and so I think that is always, always crucial. So, so as, as an example of, of um, medical research support, um, if most, most of us that work in medical research get our funding from from um, the government, so from the National Health and Medical Research Council, 
or the Medical Research Future Fund. And if you put those two together, that are a major source of medical research funding in Australia, that amounts to less than 20% of the annual profit of the Commonwealth Bank. So that just puts that into perspective into how much we value medical research in Australia. Um, one of the things is that um, there, is an, there is a new virus and a new outbreak every 18 months in the world. So we've had plenty of wake up calls in the past. Um, this is a much more severe one. And so hopefully this will um, uh, make people listen a lot more about the value of medical research. And, and um, even if something is not a, a massive problem at the moment, still working on these problems um, prepares us for the future and future pandemics. Uh, Thank Elena, you. can I get Lisa, my yeah, comments yes. quickly? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's hard for academic researchers to do this sort of work because as, as Phil says, we're spending so much of our time trying to get the grant money to even do it. And sometimes it seems esoteric research. Why spend money on something that only infects certain animals, for example? But thank goodness that certain drug companies are spending money on this. And so we ha I don't want to be political and I don't want to mention any particular drug companies, but there are drug companies who put a lot of money into research around SARS, around MERS. And the mm -hmm. only reason we're in a position right now to have clinical trials with drugs like remdesivir and others is because these companies have put money into already doing it. So all company, all countries, this should be a wake up call. We shouldn't just be leaving this to, to pharma and industry. Academic labs can be doing this as well, but it's finding the money to do it and realizing the importance to society in general at some point in time. It might not be evident or immediately obvious, but at some point in time, the more we understand viruses or, or infectious diseases in animals, the more we'll understand the capacity to, to aid uh, humankind. Let me just add also, um, in fact, 75% of the drugs or vaccines that will be trialed are coming out of industry, not academia. So this is also a wake up call to academia and our social responsibility to translate our research for the benefit of human health. Thank you, Michael. And this relates to one of the questions that we've got, and we will go to a more general Q&A in a second. Um, what's the probability of another novel virus appearing? Is the time between a new virus viral disease going to get shorter? So I'll, I can just report that, um, and where I started with pandemic flu, we always say it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the as we were saying before, the positive side of this, as bad as this is, it's a wake up call to realize there are lots of viruses circulating now. There's a virus called H7N3 in Turkey's in the US right now that could potentially threaten human health. Um, transmission from uh, swine we've seen. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's preparedness. That has to be the way forward. And as Phil and Lisa said, it's doing the research now before the pandemic, not once the pandemic hits. Because as I said, then the virus controls us and we cannot be put in that situation again. So Elena, I'll just extend on that too. So um, in the last 100 years, this is the, the, the as I said before, there, there's a new virus every 18 months. And in the last 100 years, there's been actually five coronavirus pandemics and there's been there's been three in the last 20 years. So this is not a new problem. It's just that previously we've been fortunate in that there've been much smaller problems, but now there's one that's really serious. Um, this should really you know, be a wake up call for, for doing a lot more research in these areas. Thank you. Uh, we have a question specifically around the virus affecting the cardiovascular system. Is that true? And, and how is it affecting mortality? Maybe Phil, did you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So, um, um, and we do some, we're going to do some work with Carmine Gentile here at UTS. And, um, and the cardiac tissue actually has a high levels of expression of the ACE2 receptor. Um, there's no studies yet, which I, I find quite surprising, that um, shows that there's been infections of the, actually of human hearts, but it, presumably it must happen. And it has been shown that there's infections of uh, blood vessels. Um, so, and there's a really uh, strong predisposition 
of uh, people with cardiovascular disease to, um, to COVID-19. Now, part of this could be that one of the things that the virus does is it, is it infects tissues and cells, including uh, blood vessels, and it creates a hypoxic environment. And what that does is it makes uh, blood vessels contract. And so if you've got, um, um, if you already have uh, cardiovascular disease, that's gonna make you a lot more susceptible to the effects of this vasoconstriction uh, and could well predispose your disease, exacerbate your disease, and then that's one of the major causes of death. Thanks. We're moving into the more general Q&A phase now. So I'm reading out some questions that are coming through on the chat. So please send them through. Um, Lisa, did you have more to add to cardiovascular? Just, yeah. Just a, just a quick uh, comment, if I may. Just because a cell has the receptor for a virus to enter it um, doesn't mean that the cell necessarily supports what we call productive replication of the virus. Um, it's clear cardiac tissue has the receptors for this particular coronavirus, but it doesn't look like cardiac tissue is exactly as Phil said, it is not harboring a large amount of virus. Instead, um, we think that the involvement of heart is more around the hypoxia with heart muscle tissue being particularly sensitive to that. So once you've created a state of hypoxia and an ammonia in the lungs, it's affecting heart tissue. I saw a great webinar from some um, cardiologists in Italy describing what they were seeing in their patients and saying the heart tissue for deceased patients was coming back PCR negative for the virus. And they were trying to understand that, that exact. Um, so, so viruses replicate to different levels in different, different cell types. Even if they can get in, they may not be able to replicate properly in some cell lines, but they can have other effects as Phil mentioned. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so some questions are coming through. Um, I've, uh, here's a question. Um, Colm asks, um, I've heard ferrets are a good host for vaccine white work. Why, why ferrets? Who'd like to take that one? Look, there's lots of animals you could infect as a model, but if you're gonna do scientific research, one of the things you need is some reproducibility in your animal host. So a lot of immune studies are done in mice because they're genetically identical and we can house lots of them in, in um, mouse houses, in cages, all the same way. So it's much harder to do these sort of infection studies in larger animals, like I mentioned that the, the um, Chinese paper published in, in, in Science. But ferrets are a good model because the disease looks somewhat similar to humans causing respiratory symptoms. Um, the infection can occur via an intranasal infection. So it's mimicking um, Cox postulates, if you will, of, of replicating the disease. Uh, and we can house a number of them to do the studies more easily. So there's lots of factors in why you pick a different or a specific host animal model to do it. Yeah, let me just add to that. The reason the ferret is it's one of the few animals that uh, gets infected by COVID-19 we are facing difficulty right now with the animal models. Um, they're not perfect. Um, we don't see the type of mortality you'd get with influenza. For example, Phil is working on a model, transgenic mouse model. And for the audience, I'd like to state also clearly that all animal work is done with only animal ethics approval. We use minimal number of animals. We do not want to cause any unnecessary suffering. We do not want to as, as, as well go into an animal system and testing things if we're not going to get statistically significant data. So right now, and again, because of the time frame, and this should have been worked on long before this pandemic, as Phil correctly said, we should have been better prepared. Uh, we're still racing to get to an animal model that we feel will truly be predictive in the human host. Thanks. We might go to some other questions. Just one last thing, if I may, Alana, the importance of the animal model is we can test antivirals before putting them into humans. We all want yes. an antiviral, but we need it to be safe. And that's one of the big advantages of having an animal model is to test our treatments before trialing them on humans. Thank you. With yes. ethical approval, of course. Yes. Um, so some of the questions that are coming through around things that we, we are currently coping with in terms of community. So we're gonna open up the panel now to uh, to the question of, uh, is it safe for children to come back, go back to school? Why, does it, why do children seem to be less seriously affected than adults? Uh, what are the risks of, of them interacting together as school returns? 
Um, I'll start off and I'm sure Phil and Lisa will add on. I've been in touch with one of the principals of a school here um, talking on these subjects to parents. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of uncertainty and fear and it's understandable. Not only is it the safety of the children, it's the safety of the teachers, the administrative staff. We don't wanna go into a situation that we bring the children back and we start to see uh, transmission starting up again. We can't think, even though the number of cases are very low in Australia, that it's gone and that now everything can go back to normal. Um, what I said to the school principal was, I think it's an opportunity to take some, a positive stance and use it as a means of education about viruses, about pandemics, about the need for social distancing, the effect it will have on all of our behavior. There are reports out of the UK, which Phil can speak to, of uh, effects of the virus on children. That was worrying, um, maybe a bit exaggerated, that Phil knows better than I. Um, but uh, things simply will have to be uh, controlled. Different schools are taking different approaches. One of the things that I think is a bit worrying is there isn't a consistent message about schools. And each principal is feeling very uh, uncertain um, about what to do. My advice is to teach children social distancing still and the need for that. You can't have all the hugging and um, you know close contact that we used to. Children can potentially transmit. We don't know that. To admin staff, I was asked about should the admin staff get these very fancy masks like in ICUs. Uh, these are difficult questions and I think uh, it's a, it has to be a gradual process like I said before. Care taken, constant monitoring and, and learning as we go into this. Uh, so um, we mustn't, like some countries are doing, all of a sudden think we can throw everyone back into school and we'll all be okay. So yeah, I'll just I'll follow on from Michael if that's okay. So um, so a lot of this, uh, a lot of the infections are, are associated with the level of the receptor for the virus, and uh, children seem to have less of the receptor, and it, that seems to increase as you get older. Um, there's the potential that kids have um, more of the receptor in the gut than actually in the respiratory tract, and some of these. Um, um, incidences that we're seeing that are quite rare uh, in kids has got more to do with the with the gut infections than the respiratory tract infections and there's this there's this kawasaki syndrome like syndrome that people have been um uh, uh noticing in rare cases in the uk and that's a, a hyper inflammatory response so so i think when you get in so many infections there's going to be each each individual cohort of different kinds of people is going to have some kind of infections at some point. So I think we need to look globally at what the, uh, uh, the main groups that get infected. Um, kids generally have quite a strong immune response uh, as they get, as they get up, as they get into um, adolescence and, and adulthood. And so they're able to quite control the virus. Um, they do, as, as everybody knows, they do get, uh, tend to get, lot more infections than than adults but they're they're not as um severe um and so their their immune system is quite healthy and it's good at getting rid of the virus without causing this uh, excessive immune response uh, whereas as we get older um we tend to have increases in the um in the receptor the um our cells get old uh, and they they um become senescent and they're less responsive uh, to viral infections and more susceptible to, in, to the infection in the first place. Thanks, Phil. Um, question, how does, how does the virus affect people who take immune suppressant? Um, I'm happy to answer this if you like. Um, there's a lot of really great drugs out there that work as anti-inflammatories. Uh, and sometimes they are specifically blocking some of the cytokines. They're the molecules in, in the inflammatory response and the immune response that Phil's mentioned earlier. And so doctors and clinicians are indeed looking right now at whether people on certain medications are more susceptible to this disease or to the virus. At the moment, the evidence is not coming out that they are, surprisingly. 
and it's almost counterintuitive, but Phil mentioned it, that it looks like controlling the virus well, the best treatments look like they need an element of immune suppression to, to diminish that cytokine storm. Um, so that would always be in combination with an antiviral drug. But if you're taking an immune suppressant drug for some medical condition, the answer right now is don't change your medications. If you're concerned, talk to your, doc to your doctors about it. I don't think that um, we really know uh, if you're more at risk, but people know if they take some of the anti tumor necrosis factor antibodies that they're more at risk to influenza-like illnesses. They know they have to stop taking those drugs if they get flu-like symptoms. Again, if you get flu-like symptoms, you take those drugs, you need to talk to your clinician straight away um, and they will then advise you how to, how to um, deal with the medications that you take. But at the moment, I don't think there's any evidence coming out I, that I've seen of particular cohorts of patients being more susceptible to this virus. I, I think, uh, yeah, I totally agree with what Lisa said. It is, we, we are trying to generalize a little bit here as well, mm. uh, and it will very much depend on the exact um, type of suppressant you're taking as well. But I yes. think gen generally um, uh, agree with Lisa that um, um, the immune um, anti-inflammatories are potentially beneficial uh, and yes people should not stop taking their medication yeah um question around that so clinical trials using anti-inflammatories that might be from a complementary or herbal medicine um background is that sort of stuff that you've seen coming through phil through your summary of the clinical trials that are currently in the happening in the world yes yeah there's lots lots of different trials going on going on uh, around that what is becoming a problem is there's that many trials they're competing for the patients. So uh, um, um, there are lots of trials of herbal medicines. Um, I've been approached to, to try some as well, which is, which is, which is good. Um, so, but I think, you know, we do need to, to take into account a little bit of uh, how these things are likely to work, um, to have a molecular basis for them working as, as, as well as just trying anything. I can just add and say I participated in a China-Australia meeting on use of Chinese herbal medicine against COVID. Uh, their claims, uh, the claims are very strong that um, they're getting beneficial effects. Um, and I, I think it is a very interesting area that should be pursued. And as Phil rightly says, with everything, trying to get into a test today is in fact very, very difficult. And you can often have a long line and uh, uh, often can hold back potentially uh, beneficial uh, treatments. So a um, couple more questions. Uh, what about people with cancer and COVID-19 recovering from cancer? Phil, you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So, um, so from what I've seen, it does look like um, uh, people with, with cancer do seem to be more susceptible. Um, I think it's, once again, it's quite complicated because it depends on what kind of cancer they are, um, what kind of treatments you're having for those, those cancers. Um, so, but generally, I think they are more susceptible and um, um, we need to look after those people even more. Sure. One of the most at risk groups will be people who've just had chemotherapy or something like that. Yeah. We, we already know, they already know they're immune suppressed and they are some of the most vulnerable in our society. That's why our social distancing is so important right now. So very important. Let's get to um, one of the last sort of questions before we move on, I think. Um, Wet markets. So Lisa, you sort of discussed before about um, novel viruses in wildlife as we move uh, and we understand a little bit more about wildlife and incursions into their, into their environments. But what about wet markets in general? Would you like to address any of that? Oh, happy to comment. Um, look, there's been a bit of hype about this as well, but the issue is not actually that the wet market exists. I think the real issue here is the trafficking, the trapping and then trafficking of wild animals because you don't know what that animal's been exposed to. It's not actually having a wet market. That's just really a, a meat market. I mean, the fish market in Sydney is actually a wet market, right? So from my perspective is it's not the, it's not the process per se, although maybe there's some conditions that, you know, restrictions can help prevent spread of, of infections. But the real issue from my perspective is the trapping and trafficking 
of wild animals for meat because that's where humans are going to be most exposed. And I just want to reiterate what I said right at the beginning. It's not from eating the infected animal that humans get infected. It's from the handling of an infected animal that a human will be exposed in this case, probably by respiratory droplet particle spread or, or, or the feces of the animal that's infected. Let me just add to that. Um, we did start an initiative at UTS called One Health. Mm. One Health is dedicated to this issue. It's not only viruses, it's all pathogens. Yes. Coming about as a result of interaction between humans and wildlife. Mm. And from all aspects, from health, from ethical aspects, from protecting our environment, that is a key issue for the future. And all I can say is that I totally agree with these guys, um, that um, it's, it's the trapping and, and, and harvesting of wild animals that's a problem. Thank you. I think we've I've gone through a number of the questions that have been coming through. I think we've covered most of those. Um, where can people find resource, uh, resources and information around discoveries that are, are um, verified and, and won't and can really help us understand more about the discoveries that are coming through. Um, it's, it's very nice, first of all, that we have open access uh, journals and papers are coming through very rapidly. Um, I must be frank and say there's a lot of different information coming at us to us as scientists, let alone the public. It's going to take some time you know, there's a notion that science is the absolute truth. As you know, we work hard to get to that truth, but it's not immediate. It's not like we find the answer and move on, but rather it's constant hypothesizing, testing, retesting, going back, uh, relooking, and it will take a bit of time. I think everyone should be careful in reading the media and, the, and, and, and newspapers and, and what's said uh, in the public and realize to take it all with a grain of salt. There is a lot of uncertainty. And I know, and we know it's confusing the public. Um, as we said, we, we were hit with this thing not really well prepared. We're getting to up to speed. As we do so and learn more and more, I think the information will become more solid and less uh, misinformation. So I think the, the answer to the public is, um, listen to the media. There are conflicting uh, opinions, realizing that in, in a mature way, we're still in a state of a bit of great uncertainty. We will improve as time goes by and, um, and not to overreact or underreact to a given press release. Lisa. Just, yeah, I'd just like to add to that. Um, sometimes it's hard for the general public to understand why opinions appear to be changing. But I would, I would suggest that that should give the public confidence because this is a rapidly evolving situation. And as more information comes to hand, so the scientists and the advisors of government are able to modify their, their guidance to the population. So that should give people confidence, not the opposite. And I would just be suggesting to everybody, listen to the scientists and the clinicians who are treating the patients. Don't listen to the, to the I don't know, radio shock jocks or the newspaper headlines, right? Go to the experts, see what they're saying, and don't be afraid when, the, when their advice is being modified because it's live, it's happening now, we're always updating our knowledge. Fantastic, thank you. I think that's a great comment to end with. So um, we'll wrap up the discussion there and really, really want to thank the panel so much for participating. That's been fascinating and, and um, uh, I really thank you for your time and for your efforts. Um, so, and thank you also to the audience for the fantastic questions. They've been very thought provoking. So this is, as I've said, the first in the uh, uh, first in the series of uh, events called Life After Lockdown. You can visit uts.edu.au slash um, backslash events for further events in this series. So if you have some spare time, we'd like to try a UTS taster course, visit open.uts.edu.au for free online courses. It's like I'm doing ads now. It's good, isn't it? The webinar will be posted on YouTube soon. Um, I want to thank Julie from Events for organising this. And again, thanking Phil, Michael and Lisa for a really fantastic session. Look forward to seeing you at the next event. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>